uh, June 5th, 1921, and uh, at, at 1.13 Lincoln Avenue in Rutherford, in my mother's upstairs bedroom with Dr. Willis in, a, in attendance. And um, uh, that was my first entry into Rutherford. <laughs> and uh, I've always stayed in Rutherford since then. I lived there until my uh, husband and I got married and lived with my mother for about a year. It was right after the war, and uh, he wanted me to get married during the war, and I said I couldn't do that because I was helping my mother help pay the bills. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I wanted to be sure to uh, give her at least notice. And then I was having a baby, and it was nice to have a mother around <laughs> when you're having a baby. And she helped immeasurably at that point particular time. Oh, we played oh, the usual ones like hopscotch and jump roping, uh, jumping rope, and also uh, uh, the first one that I do remember, which was interesting to me, um, we lived on Lincoln Avenue, mm -hmm. but we were on a block, and my parents gave me a scooter, which you stood up on the scooter with one foot, and then you pushed and pushed yourself and could go wherever you wanted with mm -hmm. the right foot. Mm -hmm. Well, I talked them into letting me go around the block so that I wouldn't be in the street you know, I'd keep out of the street, I wouldn't go in the street, and so we, I, I would go up Pierpont Avenue, uh, no, I would go up Addison Avenue, across Ridge Road, and down Pierpont Avenue, and come back to Lincoln. And I did that so much that the sole of my shoe of the right foot <laughs> just disintegrated. <laughs> And I had, my mother had to buy new shoes for, for me. So that wasn't the best thing. Um, later on, I did have a bicycle. Uh, not, no, I didn't have tricycles or any of that in between. But uh, the bicycle. And, and that was one thing that I really uh, got around the town. I, there weren't many cars at that time. This would have been around 1931, 20, just when the Depression was starting. And so uh, I had a friend, and we used to ride together wherever we were. And uh, we just ride different streets, and our mothers knew that we were careful and so forth. And we, once in a while, would cross over the tracks, railroad tracks in Rutherford. And we would stop at a faucet on the boil on um, that first street, Union Avenue. It is. It's continuation of our Union Avenue in Rutherford, and so uh, that uh, was very interesting because it had cold, ice cold, really very cold water coming out of it. That was the boiling springs that they talk about in Rutherford. And uh, we never missed that, you know, if we could do it. But my mother would, oh, she'd panic if she heard I was crossing the tracks. When I was eight, my father was very ill. And he uh, d died eventually of cancer. But there were three years that he was not able to work. And he um, was, uh, the last year he was in, in bed. And my mother had to take care of him. She couldn't work and so forth. So um, it was very hard for her 
and she was just glad that I could go over to the playground and it was very well run because it was summer. So those two months, July and August, was always uh, two representatives that were college students during the year and they would take those jobs and they were wonderful people. Uh, one I know ended up a doctor later on, I knew him. And um, so it was a good experience, uh, the playground, when it was supervised. See, until then we were a little bit on our own, <laughs> quite a bit. Um, and so um, then uh, that uh, they, like a rainy day, you couldn't do the things that you would do when it wasn't. So they used to do basket weaving. We used to make baskets and come home with, uh, with wooden baskets, whatever they were. And um, also, uh, uh, you know, uh, ribbon, uh, like belts. They, they just had a recent uh, TV on where the, I've seen it about ten times, where the little boy, and they're just finishing up for the playground, and the little girl gives him a little belt like this, and then <laughs> comes back, <laughs> and <coughs> he gives her something that was just tremendous, which was better, you know. So but Rutherford was then we were allowed to continue. Mm. I mean, and they they were very helpful. If anybody was hurt or anything, they were there, and my mother never had to worry about me. But that's when Pierpont was there. Now the school itself was only one building at that time. Now they've added extensions which again I can remember, which was about eight or nine when they built extensions and the playground equipment such as slides and so forth were, uh, were not there anymore. They used the, the space for, other, uh, for the school itself. So, uh, but those 10 years, my mother appreciated that help from the town. And then they would also take us like on uh, Bronx uh, Zoo on a trip all day. And then they would take us uh, to Yankee Stadium and watch the ball game. And those things we didn't have to pay for. Now everybody has to pay for it. And I don't think that's fair because there's always those few kids in town that have had a situation which I had. That's a, so the depression was uh, affected us, but then again, uh, some of us I don't think realized how bad it was for the parents to try to keep the money coming in because if they lost the jobs, it's very hard. So there's always that uh, other uh, other people in town that you have to, you know, share things a lot. And uh, over the years, Rutherford's been fairly good on it. So what were some of the difficulties that you remember from the Depression era? Some of the things you did feel, uh, the hardships? I, I personally, I don't think I, I was just glad. To, I had plenty of friends from St. Mary's. And that was another thing. Uh, my mother worked, so I always went home with another girlfriend uh, who ended up my maid of honor for my wedding and so forth. And it was her mother that lived on uh, Maple Street, and they were just two blocks away from St. Mary's School, which I attended. And, uh, and, and that's one thing that Rutherford has always been proud of, is their schools. They've always gotten very good ranking. And people came to Rutherford because they knew the school system was good for their children. That's one thing. But uh, 
the depression it didn't affect me personally too much because I was too young to realize what for everything that was going on at the time. Did you see any changes because of the d depression happening around you in the town or people you knew or um, businesses in town? That I don't remember. If it, if it was happening, of course, you're, you know, at that age, you're, <laughs> you concentrate on taking care of yourself. <laughs> but um, in later years, I did realize, I'm sure, that there were a lot of people that had the same situation that my mother had. If you could talk a little bit about how it started out was just your family in the in your house on Lincoln Avenue, but eventually oh, yes. there were people living on all four floors. Could you yes. Tell Nazarene that story, please. Yes, yes. Um, she had to take in boarders, and those are people that rent a room, but they join in, like, say, breakfast. And she prepared breakfast for them, and then at night she prepared the supper dinner, or the night dinner, whatever you want to call it. Some people call it supper, others call it dinner. Uh, and um, so we always used to be sitting at the table with them. So uh, my two brothers and, and I. And um, that was also hard for my mother because that kept her very busy, but it was good that she was able to do that. Now, uh, later on, after a couple years, she just had to give it up. She couldn't continue doing so much. And she decided to change it to an apartment. So she arranged that one bedroom be a bathroom and then uh, put a partition where you went up the stairs and to the second apartment but you couldn't change the front of the house the front of the house had to look as though it was a one family so that that was uh, an important change and um, it, but it was not as remunerative so she also did other things like conversational French. Her parents had come from France and as children, they brought the language with them and spoke it at home. So my mother had a, a very strong ability to speak French and she converted it into being a conversational French teacher. And she did very well at that, and she'd put a note, uh, an ad in the local paper, and uh, people would, if they were going to go to France, they wanted to be able to at least ask where the church was. I remember somebody, <laughs> just tell me where the church is, I'll find everything else. And so, um, so that's what she did. She did a lot of that, and she did it with my own friends. She had... Um, afternoon sessions and the mothers liked it because it helped them when they were when we were in high school so she did continue other things that she brought money in in other ways instead of cooking for everybody and we weren't allowed practically to talk at the dinner table but we listened and we learned a lot we learned a lot they're listening to another group of people The story goes back to when he was nine. He was nine and uh, he and his brother had a wagon and they were walking down Park Avenue and they saw a sign in the, uh, in the, uh, uh, in the National Grocery Store that was something like 74 Park Avenue, somewhere around that. And... Um, so he went in and he said, I'd like to apply for that job. And uh, he said, and so they said, well, uh, how old are you? And he said, nine. And he, they said, oh, no, that's, I'm sorry, that's too young. He said, well, I've got an older brother right outside, and he would do it with me, and he's 11. <laughs> 
And so sure enough, they can't let him do that. And so after many years of sitting in front of that store, they raised him to clerk status. So instead of 10 cents an order, he would get $7 a week for 60 hours. <laughs> and at that time, which was 1935, I was at the Spelling Bee, and that's when FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, president at that time, was able to get the National Recovery Act called the NRA. And at that time, the, uh, the uh, minimum wage was raised highly, and it was $21 that they got for 40 hours a week. So that's, that's what the difference was. And my mother was so pleased to hear that they finally got it passed. That's all I remember about that particular episode. But that meant that she would not have to work as hard as she's been working, you know, when she was glad to hear it. And he, of course, we used to turn our money over to her because otherwise we wouldn't be fed. <laughs> no, but it was hard to put, uh, you know, food on the table. And one, the one thing that covered that was that there was a union packing company also on Park Avenue, lower down than that, and it, it catered to the uh, the well-off people in Rutherford. And But she had an agreement with the butcher that worked there that the leg of lamb, the breast of lamb, not the breast of lamb, the, the, the bones, mm -hmm. I forget, I called them. Lamb chops? The, 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 the was, it was lamb uh, bones that had very little meat on them, and they, they couldn't sell it. So they offered it to my mother for 10 cents a pound. So after she made the deal, she gave me the enough money, and she said, well, go down and pick them up. And I would walk all the way. But I was allowed to buy an ice cream cone before I came home. And that instilled, that inspired me. Now, how old was I? I would say not more than 12, I guess, was I allowed to walk around town. You know, it got, it got to be a bigger town by then. But there was one time, one stage there, that I mentioned that there was no cars around going down slave riding on the slave rider we that was my first my first introduction into what the councilmen do and that was we were young kids and we wanted to get the slave riding to be blocked off so we could ride our sleds down the roads in Rutherford and so um, we asked our mothers to vote for the councilman who said they would put that in. And that's the first time I knew there was such a thing as a mayor and council that was the real government in the town. So um, that was a factor, too. What uh, street would you go sledding on? Oh, I, you'd start at East Pierpont and Rich Road and go down straight down on East Pierpont, all the way down past Sylvan, Mountain Way, and that would be blocked off. Ocean, uh, Orient Way could not be blocked off because it was considered, um, in fact, the man that put Orient Way in, and put, uh, put it in at that time was Grizz Holman, the uh, man who had a moving company. And so, and he personally told me the story that he had decided that Park Avenue was too small a, a distance to make it profitable. And so he wanted the main part of town to be Orient Way. And at first they used to park the cars diagonally to give more room for parking, and then they gave that up. and put the parking straight and so forth.
but uh, it never developed. A few stores at the other end, but never went down all the way. And uh, people who lived on Orient Way would not sell their home to anybody that had that idea of expanding it to be the main road. Now they want to put a bike path on Orient Way, on both sides. That was in the paper just last week. To put the parking stays, you can park there, but next to you will be a bike path. So you will have bikes passing through. Very dangerous. But of course it's worse the way it is now because that's what they do. So it all worked out fine. We had a wonderful time. They had us there for a whole week. And the last day, I just read something. I have lots of paperwork on that spelling bee. I have a book that I put, put everything together in. And, in. and um, the word was buoy. And he pronounced it exactly that way, buoy, and he said it's a marker in the river so that if a boat is f f uh, going through that it doesn't hit that particular thing. So they call it a buoy, right? Well, I went and I hesitated and I spent a couple minutes trying to figure that one out and I suddenly remembered life boy soap. And if anybody remembers that, it was a pink, a, he a big chunk of s a soap that if you got grease on your hands, that's what you had to use to get. And so I said, could it also be pronounced boy? And he said, well, let me look it up. And he looked it up and of course it was there. So I said, okay. And I sell it, B-U-O-Y. Well, that impressed the Herald Newsman that was running the spelling bee. And I think he was rooting for me because there were once or twice when things went a little bit wrong at the end. And if they, um, the, the, they didn't understand the rules of the game, you know, the certain rules, and one word, uh, I, I, I can't remember exactly, I don't want to bring up too many words. Um, but it was uh, a, a real experience, even at the end. And the, another thing I have not mentioned to anybody is the boy who came out second, and probably would have been first if I had missed on boy, uh, he ended up in the war and he was killed. And I always remember that. I have his picture. If they're going to show any pictures, it's me standing, shaking his hand. And that always gets me upset a little bit. <laughs> I feel sorry for him. So, okay, what else now? I, oh, and then now about FDR. They allowed us to... Uh, 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 they kept telling us we were going to be able to go and see FDR. Franklin Delano Roosevelt in his office and we waited one day we went in and out of one office and every time you go in another office you thought oh okay now we'll see him well that day went by we never saw him and they added an extra day to our week at the very end and that's the day at 11 o'clock in the morning everybody had to be ready that you were going to see FDR. My mother would have loved to have come with me for that, but she wasn't able to. So there were only 20 spellers. 20 spellers is all that there were at that time. Now they have 240 spellers. That's this past year. And, and uh, so I don't think they do things like that. I don't think you were able to shake hands with and there's very few people, I have yet to run into anybody who was, had ever shaken hands with FDR, because I'd love to tell that story, you know. And he was very nice. 
but we had the original Passaic around our necks, you know, the, the whatever we won. So he asked me, uh, what state is Passaic in? And I said, New Jersey. And he said, oh, okay. <laughs> and I don't know if he asked anyone, nobody ever in those days, no child outspoke and asked their own questions or anything, you know, we just didn't do it. But uh, it was still an experience. So, of course, everybody wouldn't let anybody shake that right hand for a couple hours. And <laughs> that was the biggest thing that we got out of it at that age, anyhow. But uh, that was quite an experience. main thing was, and if you've been a, a councilman in town and things go on, you're very alert and reading newspapers and seeing what they're doing and so forth. And all of a sudden I've run into this situation where the state is taking over our Meadowlands and taking away our zoning ability and not paying us for that land. And I thought, oh, this is terrible. And then they had a tax sharing plan with the 14 towns that were involved. And so they had, um, first of all, it was, uh, the, we had to get it passed. First of all, it was Fairley Dickinson Jr. who was a senator and he wanted to get it changed and whatnot. And he just lasted the one term as Senate. But he did uh, encourage um, to have the formula adjusted. And he wanted that formula to be a little bit more accurate, or especially in the beginning. That formula still existed right up until recently. And they've made one change recently. But there was a time when I ran for office and I thought the only way I'm going to find out is what's going on on that situation down the middle end. And so I ran for office. And it was a case where the Democrats that year had their own little convention and we could apply to run for the spot. And so uh, I did, and I won it at, at, the, uh, conve at the convention. So that's what put me on the road to running for office. And I did spend a lot of time on that tax sharing formula. Many, many years. I didn't have a computer. I'd go to the library and I inserted it into the library uh, computer and the librarian allowed me to go anytime I wanted. It was one computer at that time in the library. And so I did, and, and uh, anybody will tell you <laughs> that they know Margaret Shack always wants to talk about that tax sharing formula and nobody wants to listen. <laughs> but it is, a, it's an interesting uh, formula. And it was a case where 14 towns had sections of their town in the middle end. It had to be those 14 towns. And the ones that could develop and get real estate taxes coming into their tills, that it would be advantageous to have the, uh, uh, have the, be the ones that got the, the taxes off it. Well, then that didn't work though because they had to share it with the other 14 towns who couldn't put any in because they, some of them didn't even have room and others had so much wasted which was underwater and they still counted it as acreage and there was all these arguments going on about it that it was a very involved issue. And uh, I finally did... Um, get uh, uh, everybody involved enough to get the legislature to change it instead of keeping 
of your real estate taxes, the ones that that did put in, they could keep 60%. And then when we talked this over with Governor Kane at that time, Thomas, Tom Kane, he wanted Teterboro out because of the fact that the tax sharing got it's six people. Six people in Teterboro lived in Teterboro. It was all industrial. It was a small town. It was all industrial. And so, um, so that, uh, we agreed to that. We took Teterboro out. And the other thing was to, the, another thing, and it came from his office, so I don't, can't say it was he, 2% um, per year. If you did it 2% per year from 50, and it would be 52, 54, and so forth, and when it got to be 60, then you stopped. Then that would have accomplished that. So since then, now a lot of years have been through, through since then. That was like 1940s, I don't know, 1970s or eight, one of those. But it was a lot of years that they've been... Uh, feel uh, the the towns putting in have talked about going to court. Well, finally, two of them did. They went to uh, court on it, and the court said it had to be changed. Mm. So they've worked on it very hard, and just recently, they have uh, they got the state putting their own money into help those towns that are putting money in. Mm. So it's a, another situation. I don't think it's real tax sharing myself, but mm -hmm. it's uh, so unequal that uh, I don't know if they'll ever improve on it. It was a, a very interesting campaign, <laughs> and I had uh, uh, right away it hit the press because I was a woman because I did win the highest total of the four of us that had to run, two Republicans and two Democrats. And uh, I was on the Democratic side. And so uh, that uh, uh, 20 former Democratic councilmen, mayors, everybody, I've got about 20 letters if anybody wants to see them, encouraging me and thanking me for running and all this, and they gave me different ideas of how to run. Make sure you get the vote out was the main thing. And we worked very hard to get the vote out. And people did get out. I had six children in school and so forth, and their parents all came out and all was talking to the other people, don't forget to vote, you know. And so it was the first time a woman had even... No, some, uh, somebody had won before me. Two, two people had run before me, and they didn't win, you know. And it, uh, it's a typical man's job, let me tell you. <laughs> but then again, I guess I did all right. So uh, I, we had, uh, you know, meetings and meetings, and, oh, we had to... Uh, uh, our mayor at the time was Bill Brooks, and he had us every day and every night that we had time to go out and ring doorbells. So that I definitely did. So you have a funny story about ringing doorbells, I understand. Oh, I do? <laughs> I, don't I don't know. About uh, perhaps... I don't think I put it in there, did Mrs. I? Kitchen, on home Avenue. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I did tell him. <laughs> okay. I went to this uh, one home, and uh, I thought I knew the person there, but I wasn't sure. And so we did, we had a good talk, but it turned out she had one step right by her door that you had to walk up to ring a doorbell. And so I did, and then when I came out and we finished our conversation, I forgot that it was there. And I started to fall until I got to the next flight of stairs and went all the way down to the bottom. Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, 
And I didn't uh, hurt myself badly, but I did uh, skin the knee or something like that, you know. So uh, years later, I will say that I have trouble with my one leg, you know, but it wasn't just from that. It was from other things, too. So, uh, so I survived. And then, oh, <laughs> and then one of the Republican councilmen's son knew my son Jim, and suddenly I'm on the couch resting from this tragedy. <laughs> and he, he said, uh, oh, I can go home and tell my dad he'll be tickle pink. <laughs> you won't be able to. <laughs> you won't be able to ring doorbells. <laughs> but he was only teasing, of course, you know. We never had animosity to the different parties. Once November was over, and there was uh, two councilmen I give credit for the way this town was run, was Ray Carey and Will Reinster. And they were terrific for this town because Will Reinster was there for 25 years, and I think I can use names in this case. And he was, he knew everything about what was at Memorial Field and what was under the ground at Memorial Field before we even developed it after the war. That was a special in, a credit to the veterans that served their country. And that was planned that way. Well, Will knew everything about it, and the rest of us knew nothing. <laughs> but he always was on top of everything. And he never became mayor. And never, because he had a full-time job, and so did Ray Carey. And they were both very efficient people and never antagonized anybody. Whereas uh, locally, we have a lot of bickering a little bit, you know, now. It seems like it doesn't, things don't get done as fast. So what was it that prompted you to run as the first, you know, as oh, a woman for council, even was, though? Well, it was the Meadowlands. That tr the the problem tax. of them taking over our Meadowlands. I thought, if, unless you get and see the paperwork that's floating around, you don't know anything. And uh, it's pretty hard to run for something unless you have a, uh, a reason for running, and that was one reason. And that was very definite. My family all knew about it, you know, so they didn't object. My husband always encouraged me in everything. I always cleared with him. Bill Brooks, uh, our mayor, who had at least one term and uh, had about four months, or well, probably probably six months, we thought at that time, uh, to run yet from July until December, say. And uh, his mother was uh, had a stroke. The father was taking care of the mother who had a stroke. And then... Um, after that, he, uh, uh, his mother-in-law ended up in the hospital. So, I mean, he was, and he had three young boys, and Bill was all involved in all sorts of sports uh, and sports programs and whatnot. So he, it was very hard for him to continue. And so one night he up, er, definitely resigned. And then it become, became catastrophic, <laughs> catastrophe, because I tried to talk. It had to be a Democrat. He was a Democrat, so it had to be a Democrat by law. And so hey, we um, talked. I talked the other two councilmen that were Democrat men, and I couldn't talk any of them into running. Nobody wanted to run. <laughs> and... So, of course, then who has to do it is me. I just had to. And so Frank approved. He thought it would be such an honor, and I guess it was. I mean, I did consider it an honor, and I tried very hard to. Uh, I didn't work at all those months that I was mayor, and I tried to do the right. You know, I was a good mayor. 
And I always was worried about the economy and how it was affecting our taxes, you know, and so forth. So uh, that everybody remembers me for that as being, uh, you know, I, I did. And I was a member of the Rutherford Taxpayers Association is another reason. Because that was our prime goal, was to try to keep the taxes down without ruining other things. You know, and we did a good job when we were available. So would you consider that your biggest accomplishment as mayor? Yes, I would say so. That's as far as I've gone, and I'm not going any further. Right now, I'm pretty old to be doing anything, so I'm, I'm not interested in anything. And I hear they're going to have an annual update on this thing, so <laughs> I hope I'm here for the next one even.